We have just learned the formal definition of a limit where um, x is going to c of f of x is equal to l. But we're not restricted to uh, formal definitions of limits with c and l both being numbers. So what we're going to do is expand this formal definition to uh, what it would look like for if l was equal to infinity, if c was equal to infinity, or if perhaps both were equal to infinity. And we can even do this with negative infinity in any place as well. And so we're going to cover that in this this uh, video. So I have as the recall the formal definition of a limit that we've uh, just learned with C and L being numbers. And so we need to be able to take that formal definition and modify it appropriately so that we can handle the case when L is not a number but rather when L is infinity. And so look at what's different. The L is what's changing. The C did not change at all. And so really, uh, the information about the X's hasn't uh, changed at all. And so the information we associate with X's are this are the x interval as well as that um, x distance. So the x distance that we had was that delta. So that delta greater than zero doesn't change and neither does the um, that punctured interval that we have for the x's. So x is in the c minus delta to c or c to uh, c plus delta. Those are going to be the same as they were for the original um, formal definition. Uh, but what has changed here is that instead of a finite value c, we're looking, or sorry, l, instead of a finite value l, we're looking at l is equal to infinity. And so really we're not going to be looking at a fixed um, y value that we deviate up and down from when we're talking about that epsilon distance away from it. What we're going to do instead is we're going to basically um, bound off towards infinity. So really we need kind of a, an interval at infinity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call um, some large distance, really some large or some large y value, um, m is what we're going to use. So instead of the epsilon greater than zero, where we usually think about epsilon as being kind of a small uh, distance on the y-axis, we're going to be talking about for all m greater than zero, where m is some y number, but we think about that y number being a pretty big number because we're thinking about, you know, approaching infinity here. So we say for all m greater than zero, there exists the delta such that if x is in that punctured interval around c, then where is f of x going to be? Well, remember, the function is going off to infinity, so really we're thinking about the function being kind of in an interval um, near infinity. So we would say f of x is in the interval m to infinity. So we're kind of taking a, a big value, a big y value m, and saying it's got to be at least that big. It's got to be bigger than the, um, the value m so that we're getting close enough to infinity. And so that's our new statement. Uh, so we want to take a look at what that would look like on a graph. So here's our statement that we copied from the previous page for all m greater than zero. So again, we're thinking about m as being kind of a big y value. And see what we can do, uh, just like we had done with the epsilons, uh, or the l plus and minus epsilons, is we would trace back uh, to the x-axis. So we've got two points here, one from the left and one from the right, really, um, that we would trace back down to the x-axis to get a sense of where they came from. Okay, so we would get two x values that would give us the output values um, m if we were to uh, plug them into the function. So again, those two x values on the x-axis give us two x distances. And so you see the one here on the left is the smaller x distance. And so really what's going to happen here, because this is the small one, uh, that distance there is going to be the delta that we choose. Because see, this other one was bigger, and again, we always want to go smaller so that we stay in that vertical um, strip. Um, that vertical strip then would force us into the interval that would be above the m. So that's how we take care of this if we switch the l to infinity. So what if we switch the c to infinity instead, but keep the l as a finite value? So again, here on the left, we have the original statement that um, had c and l both finite. And on the right, our new statement where we have uh, now our c is going to be 
um, infinity. And so this time, all of the information surrounding L, or really the, uh, the y-axis information, is going to remain the same as it was for the original statement. So we're still going to have the epsilon this time. So we have the epsilon greater than zero, and then that's still going to keep us into this um, place where f of x was living there. So f of x is going to still be in the L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon uh, range there. Okay? Uh, and that's because we kept our L finite for this particular case. So the thing that changes here is because C, our particular x value that's interesting for this limit statement, um, that's going off to infinity now. So instead of talking about some small x distance away from C, what we're really talking about is close enough to infinity um, for the x-axis, really. And so now we need some other like big x value, and we're going to let that be n that would kind of go along with the M from the previous definition. So we'll say there is some capital N greater than zero where we're understanding that capital N to be kind of a large um, X value. And so we say such that if X, we really want X to be close to infinity. So we say if X is um, from N to infinity, some big value to infinity, that would be what we're calling close enough to infinity, then our f of x is um, as close to L as we are prescribing. And so uh, that's how we change the statement, the formal definition, but then what it looks like on our graph is slightly different than the previous one. Instead of a vertical asymptote like the uh, previous example, we're looking at a horizontal asymptote because we're looking at where x is going off to infinity, so we're kind of talking about end behavior here. And that end behavior being finite is telling us a horizontal asymptote. So here on the left, we have the statement that we just came up with. So we want to see what that looks like uh, graphically. So we say for all epsilon greater than zero, so that epsilon was telling us how much to go up and down from the uh, L value, the limit value. And so what we can do then, just like we had done in the original setup, is once we've deviated both above and below L, we can go and we can see where does that, um, where does the function that we're dealing with touch the, um, or sorry, if we, if we trace towards the function, we can see every place where that horizontal line is going to hit the function. And you see it's in several places, which would give us kind of several candidates for this n value. But we see finally, once we get past this final n value, or this final point here, our function no longer escapes from this kind of horizontal strip that we have. Since the function's approaching that horizontal asymptote, at the point that I've labeled here um, that corresponds to the x value of n, we now are in the strip and will be forever close enough to that horizontal asymptote. And so that's how we get the, um, the particular large n value or x value that we're calling n is by tracing these uh, or looking across the the function seeing all the places that it hits and realizing kind of that last place that it hits before it lands in this strip forever and so that's how we handle this if c is infinite and then the last case that I really want to talk about is, well, what if both L is infinite and C is infinite? So again, on the, the uh, left-hand side, we have the original statement where they were finite, and we need to modify that here on the right-hand side to be able to take care of the situation where both of these are going to infinity. So um, nothing's going to stay exactly the same since both of them are going off to infinity instead of a, a set number. And so we're going to utilize the notation we established in the previous two setups um, using the same letter that we had used before. So the M was kind of our large Y value. So instead of the small Y distance of epsilon, we need the large Y value of M for the first blank. So we would say for all M greater than zero, there exists, and now we're not talking about a small um, X distance that we're deviating from C, we're talking about a large X value so that we can bound it towards infinity there. So we would use the N greater than zero for the next blank. 
So we say for all m greater than zero, there exists an n greater than zero, such that if x is n, so we need the interval that's a, that's kind of the interval around infinity, if you want to think about it that way, um, and the x would go along with the large x value n out to infinity. And then that would tell us then that the function f of x is going to be in that interval around infinity on for the y-axis, if you want to think about it that way. And so we would take our large y value m to infinity, bounding the function up towards infinity for the y direction as well. So what this looks like on the graph would be something like this. We have an example of a picture where as we go out to infinity, as x goes out to infinity, so looking at the right-hand side of the graph, our function value is going up without bound, and so that uh, limit there is going to be infinity as well. And so what we do here is um, our statement says for all m greater than zero, so we can pick an m big enough, whatever big enough is for the situation, and we can again trace here to the function. We see it hits right there. We can trace back down to see what, what x value or corresponds with the m value given. And um, what we see is that we can we only see this hitting really in one place. I mean, I guess here this looks like a parabola and it would also hit in a kind of a big, well, a very negative direction, I suppose. But that's not relevant in the context. We're looking at as x is going out to positive infinity, and so we're certainly looking really only on the right-hand side of the graph there. Um, but then that would give us our situation there. Given an m, we can find an n that corresponds to it that would keep the um, this end arrow going up to positive infinity. It would never dip back down. So we can also extend these ideas to where we let either L or C or both, instead of going to infinity, go to negative infinity. And really what the only difference would be would be what our interval is. We could still use the M and the N as kind of large Y value for M and large X value for N. Um, but then our intervals would change for the uh, for the, either the x or the f of x, and so if we're talking about l going off to infinity, that l is our y value, and so we would be talking about f of x would be in the interval now not uh, near infinity, but rather near negative infinity. But see, remember our m that we're using is understood to be a a large positive. Uh, y value. So instead of a large positive y value, we would need the large negative y value. And so we would take the negative m also. Um, for the c, we're talking about c being kind of the x value, the x axis information. And so if c is going off to negative infinity, we're talking about an interval around negative infinity. And for the x's, we were using the large x value to be an n, so we would take it as a negative n so that we can wrap around negative infinity instead. So as a recap here, there's kind of some notation that we just need to kind of associate with um, x or y and distances and values and so forth. So as a recap, the y value that we're looking at on all of these is our limit value l which may or may not be plus or minus infinity, but in general, L we're talking about as the limit value. To go along with that, we're usually talking about, or we're always talking about C being the X value we're approaching. Now that X value we could think about as not a value, but rather plus or minus infinity. But when we see some number C there, or something in the place of where we have C in the definition, we're talking about an X value. Um, for distances, whenever L is finite, we're talking about a distance up and down from the L. That Y distance there is going to be our epsilon that we use. That's the notation that's just canonical for these definitions. And to go with it, the X distance, so if we have C being finite and we go up and, or we go to the left and to the right of C, we would be talking about a distance uh, delta from the C. And then, of course, if we have either, or if we have L being infinite 
uh, either negative or positive infinity, we need to incorporate some what we're calling large, and it really is a large positive y value that we're talking about. And we're using the capital letter M there. I think probably because we associate it with like a, a maximum of a function or something like that. Okay. Uh, and then to go along with the capital M, we would have the capital N being understood to be a large positive x value that would be utilized in these definitions.